Hello everybody, this is week 14 and uh, this week we are going to be talking about animal ethics and uh, this is a video that we're going to watch today and I have um, a couple of tasks. One is the uh, discussion question and there's a um, just a sort of journal post, uh, journal uh, exercise for you to do of 100 words or so at the end. So um, these a couple of tasks um, should take you through Monday and Tuesday of this week. So um, this week, animal ethics, we are focused on the ethical treatment of animals. And there's a number of topics in the reading that uh, I'll walk you through in this um, in this presentation. And those include animal research, vegetarian, vegetarianism, moral vegetarianism. Um, so eating um, eating not eating meat for a moral reason um, and endangered species as well. And we'll also look at some different philosophical approaches uh, based on the idea of rights or utilitarianism um, later on in the presentation as, as well. So we'll let's start off by looking at the topics and we'll sort of break them down and see what's involved. And then we'll turn to look at some philosophical approaches to animal ethics and see if we can make sense of some of these approaches. Some of them have, we'll see are more radical um, than others and sort of go a lot further in trying to think about the rights of animals and, and what this involves and the sort of obligations of our treatment towards them. Um, so we'll, we'll take up these, um, these arguments and see where they lead a bit later on in the presentation. Hmm, so this is a kind of um, a, a sort of graphic, a very graphic representation of um, of a certain way of thinking about the human relationship to animals, which is um, largely as a source of food uh, in this in this particular case. And the the sheer numbers every year are quite um, yeah quite eye catching. Uh, the numbers of uh, different animals, different animal species that are raised um, and killed. For for food. Um, obviously they wouldn't, you know, what would the population be if they weren't grown for food? Who knows? But there are sort of issues of humane treatment um, here as well. Uh, the sort of more troubling the, the wildlife um, and the number of species that are sort of killed off, um, which is uh, which which has a lot of repercussions as, as we'll see as well a little later. So the first a subject to think about here is uh, moral vegetarianism and this was um, sort of defended by uh, Mohandas K Gandhi as one of the um, one of the representatives and of course this is this is sort of a tradition in Hinduism um, where Gandhi sort of gets it from the idea of, of of all life as being kind of sacred and and our sort of duty to um, to protect life in all its forms, as is, is a very much a, a sort of moral current um, running through some Hindu traditions. So Gandhi takes up that um, that idea very much, and he says, "To my mind, the life of the lamb is no less precious than that of a human being. I should be unwilling to take the life of a lamb for the sake of the human body. I hold that the more helpless a creature, the more entitled it is to protection." by man from the cruelty of man. So very much a kind of equivalence there. Um, all life um, for Gandhi is as being of equal value, all life as being kind of sacred. Um, so an, an unwillingness to um, to kill for the sake of sort of sustaining the human body. So that's a kind of, that's the broad moral impulse between um, behind the idea of moral vegetarianism. Um, some people obviously adopt vegetarian diets for health reasons, um, and that can be for a number of reasons because of allergies, desire for a low fat, more healthy diet, etc. Many people, however, are vegetarian for ethical reasons, and that um, takes us um, into this subject of animal welfare. So are there good moral reasons to avoid the consumption of animals and animal, pro and animal products? Um, would be the relevant question here. So let's run through the, let's call it the meat eaters position. Um, and there's a number of, there's a number of claims that could be made from this perspective about 
um, about meat eating and its sort of ethical value as a um, as a kind of re repost to the position of moral vegetarianism. Uh, firstly, of course, custom and tradition uh, maintain that animals are there for our use. There is a hierarchy of beings with humans at the top. Um, yeah, so this comes from a long lines of custom and tradition. It's it's a kind of biblical motif that um, you know God provides the animals for human use, um, and that was very much a, kind, a sort of cornerstone of. Um, of, of Western civilization, this idea of a hierarchy of beings um, with human beings very much um, at, at the top and sort of having disposal over over animal, um, all other forms of life. So this is very, you know, very different to the sort of the, the equivalence and the, um, the unity of all beings, which, which we saw with Gandhi. Here there's a kind of, it's seen as a kind of hierarchy with humans, um, human life being very different. Um, and animals being sort of relegated to a secondary status. Um, so typically here, you know, this sort of runs through a lot of um, a lot of the Western tradition with animals being sort of part of the material, um, this mere material layer of life. And it's only human beings that have this special something, whether it's a mind, uh, whether it's a spirit, whether it's a soul or, or whatever. So human beings are kind of distinguished um, from the rest of animal life as being uh, as being very very kind of different and distinct. So that's very different to Gandhi's perspective. Animals, uh, to move to the second point, may not feel pain uh, at least in the same way and to the same extent as humans. Uh, so yeah, this is one of the uh, one of the controversial issues here of the extent to which animals can actually feel pain. And do they feel pain in the same way that humans feel pain? Um, and as I think we've we've mentioned before, probably there are differences here in terms of um, the lack of memory and the lack of um, anticipation, uh, expectation with, with animals. Perhaps pain doesn't carry the same um, doesn't carry the same resonance, the same sort of weight that it does uh, with beings who have a sort of conscious ability to to remember and to sort of predict. Um, and sort of have a different sort of relationship to time, maybe that, that animals do in their own sort of conscious existence. That being said, there's still there's there's no reason to doubt that animals feel pain um, and that they're sensitive to pain and that they avoid pain. Um, so it's not you know this is not a kind of absolute um, arguments against animal pain. It's clear there's um, that there are responses. It's clear they have. Uh, a kind of sensory life like we do and they're sort of um, and they're vulnerable to to sort of suffering in 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 in, um, in sort of situations in which we suffer um, you know although perhaps not um, to the same sort of mental degree but still there's there's um, there's a lot of evidence for the existence of, of animal pain um, and we just don't know uh, frankly, the extent of how far it goes, um, it goes down, or how much it's similar to, 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 to the way that humans suffer. So another thing that is sometimes uh, mentioned is that vegetarianism is said to be uh, this word here, supererogatory, um, and that basically means that it might be very admirable to abstain from eating animals. In other words, you know, you're doing a very admirable thing. But there's no moral duty to do so, right? In other words, it's 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 maybe a it's maybe something we can praise people for, um, but it, it's as though they're it's as though they're going an extra mile, right? It's as though that they're doing something sort of beyond the bounds of duty, going going an extra distance, and you know they can be praised for that. But it doesn't follow from that 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 not eating meat is a moral duty for everybody. Right. Um, it, it may still be that there's no we can still say, well, there's no um, there's no moral duty to do that, even though it's it's an admirable thing to do to to care so much about cruelty, um, etc. Others will argue uh, the final point that it depends on how humanely animals are raised and treated. So um, whether they're raised and treated in a cruelty free way, um, which sounds like you know, it sounds like an easy and clear thing to to establish. Either it's cruelty free or it's not, but um, it's a little bit uh, more complicated. And, and you know, there are different sets of rules and, and different sort of arguments about 
about how to apply them and so on. So um, this tends to get a bit muddy as well. Now, so the utilitarian position, remember utilitarianism cares about the greatest happiness, greatest happiness for the greatest number, um, doesn't really focus on individuals, um, but is, is concerned with um, preventing suffering um, and increasing well-being. So a key question for utilitarianism is whether animals suffer pain in the food production process. And how do we weigh the suffering and pain? Yes, this is a real dilemma. How do we weigh the suffering and pain of animals against the human interest in nutritious and tasty food? Right. Obviously, we can't set that as zero because humans um, derive pleasure and satisfaction from eating um, from eating burgers and steaks and all kinds of tasty um, and perhaps um, to some degree nutritious food. So we have to put that on the scales and we have to weigh that against the suffering of um, of the pain of animals who are the, the sort of maybe the ways that they are raised um, and the ways that they are killed. So how should we evaluate uh, the utilitarian position sort of leads us to this question, I think. How should we evaluate uh, and weigh the suffering of animals? Is their pain less traumatic than that of humans? And if it is, does that mean that um, we sort of have to give their pain less weight? Again, we can't give it zero weight because of course they do suffer, um, but, but perhaps we give it less weight um, and we have to, again, compare it against the human interest in, um, in, 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 uh, in, in eating certain kinds of food, in being able to sort of um, have convenience and, and sort of tasty eating options, etc. So I think the, the question, uh, one way of sort of thinking about this is to think about whether utilitarianism would rule out industrial agriculture of the kind. Um, you know, we're also um, so um, so shocked by when we see uh, pictures of these masses of animals in these confined spaces. Um, so the kind of situations where animals are confined in, in these spaces, they're force fed without space for exercise and susceptible to infectious diseases. Um, and of course, that, that susceptibility is why they're um, fed antibiotics um, pretty constantly, which um, you know leads to a lot of uh, other knock-on problems, um, which people really uh, are still trying to figure out the repercussions of. So, you know, all of these situations, animals are bred to unsustainable sizes um, and they're bred to, to the form where they're unable to stand up. So they're not even sort of healthy, viable life forms. They're just bred to be, um, to sort of um, possess as much as much breast meat as possible, for instance, in the case of chickens and turkeys. Um, so you get unsustainable sizes, unsustainable forms of these animals. Um, so it seems like you've got some kind of an argument um, from a utilitarian perspective to say, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of suffering going on here. There's a lot of um, animals are certainly not you know being bred in optimal conditions that optimize their well-being and happiness. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So is this, you know, is this sort of preponderance of very, <clears throat> very bad conditions, the lack of exercise, lack of space, the force feeding, etc. Does this sort of tip the scales um, in favor of um, in favor of saying there's too much suffering here and this is unsustainable? Um, again, balanced against the human interest in eating uh, in eating meat. So that's, you know, that's something we, we all have to, we're all going to make a judgment of. Whether utilitarianism is, again, the best, uh, the best way of thinking about these things, we'll look at some, uh, a number of approaches later on as, as well. So some other arguments against factory farming that I think we might consider. Uh, firstly, there are nutritious and delicious alternatives to meat. I'm sure you've heard about the new um, meatless alternatives that Burger King uh, and other places are now um, are now starting to develop, and by all accounts, they <clears throat> they taste just like meat. Um, things like uh, tofu recipes are in, are improving, so you know all kinds of substitutes, uh, wheat-based meat substitutes, soy-based meat substitutes. Um, these things are improving all all the time, so. 
and and the you know the advantage of eating the advantage of eating alternatives to meat is is that animal agriculture is very very hard on the environment um, grain production uh, has to be intense because animals eat uh, eat grains um, it takes a lot of water to raise land animals and waste removal <clears throat> excuse me is a constant problem so the the, the sort of ta the the stress that animal agriculture places on the environment um, is a, I think a, a strong argument in favor of um, encouraging other alternatives to uh, to factory farming and, and if Again, you know, one of the arguments for factory farming is humans need these uh, these nutritious and tasty foods. Well, if there are alternatives, then that's, you know, that's not such a good argument. And maybe then the the sort of the suffering of animals in that process is going to weigh more heavily um, eventually when we decide whether it whether it's permissible or not. So the final point here, <clears throat> a point made by some feminists has been to connect meat eating with a history of male dominance or patriarchy and argue that an ethics of care should include an eth uh, should include a care for animals. Um, that's certainly, you know, that sort of comes out of the the sort of biblical idea of, of humans as as sort of the stewards or the patriarchs of nature, sort of having um, that, that nature is given to humans as their domain and they're entitled to sort of kill and eat whatever they want. Um, so that that does appear to reflect that biblical um, understanding does appear to reflect a certain kind of idea of patriarchy, this idea that that, that humans um, are in charge of nature, this idea that that there's a, a sort of hierarchy and those at, at the top get to decide um, and determine what happens to the lives of those sort of further down the chain. So in, so there's a sort of questioning of this from the perspective of the ethics of care, uh, where it said that this should include a kind of care, a kind of caring for animals that, that really, um, and, and we can see there the, the way that an ethics of care might be quite radical in challenging the sort of mainstream um, traditions of, of patriarchy that kind of run from biblical sources. Okay, so another issue to think about and reflect on is animal experimentation. And animal research has a very long history, um, going right back to the ancient world, of course. Many important advances in the 20th century in medicine were made possible by animal testing. Um, for example, cures for infectious diseases, immunization techniques and antibiotics were, were made possible by animal testing. Um, so this is often, often mentioned as a kind of reason for the importance of, of animal testing. Um, of course, there was sort of there was human testing in the Second World War as well, and the, the Nazis and the Japanese um, tested, you know, some uh, ideas, some theories, and some um, and some um, you know diseases and stuff on um, on prisoners of, of war and on um, other sort of um, un so-called undesirable groups, and some you know cures came out of that process. Um, but of course, nobody's saying that that justifies human experiments. So, you know, we should be careful about saying, well, you know, they've been successful, so therefore um, we should continue to do it. We always have to weigh on the other side. Well, what are the, uh, what's the, what's the suffering that we have to weigh up? What's the, um, you know, what's the, uh, the sort of pain that we cause to animals? How do we affect their lives, etc.? Um, so we have to be careful to consider both sides of the scale. I think. The Humane Society estimates that 25 million uh, animals are used in animal experiments each year in the United States. So an important question here, I think, is whether the use of animals is still necessary, given the advanced state of medical research today. So um, as with sort of growing animals for food, the, the, a relevant ethical question here is whether we've with the resources we have today, whether we've outgrown these um, these practices of animal research and whether whether it's still necessary to do these things uh, or whether there are in fact better, more humane uh, ways of doing of doing research that don't cause 
the same degree of suffering that animal research does. So let's think about endangered species then, another, um, another subject discussed in the reading this week. The destruction of animals' habitats uh, is probably the most potent threat to species survival, right? So when we're talking about species, we're talking about the group as a whole rather than individuals. And, and that's an important distinction. Um, here it's, it's, it's as though we, it's as though the, um, the imperative is to protect the species as a whole, that the species has a sort of identity through time um, in distinction from the individual, each individual member of the species. Um, obviously, you have to protect uh, some individuals to protect the species, but you don't have to protect any particular individual. Um, so this is a slightly different way of looking at things. But the, the threat to species survival through logging, damming rivers, mining, drilling, building pipelines um, has been a serious, uh, serious problem for, for a long time, of course. The over-exploitation of animal populations as well in fishing. Um, there's been a number of um, a number of areas where, you know, fishing has been um, uh, carried out to the point of driving certain populations to the brink of extinction. And then there's a there's a sort of ban on fishing for a time, and then it's sort of started up again, and the you know they're driven to the brink of extinction again. Um, so that process has been as again has been going on, and it's sort of regulated now. Uh, by bodies like the European Union and and, um, and those sort of organizations, but it's still a, um, you know, it's still a sort of constant problem of uh, animals being overfished, overexploited, um, and driven to near extinction. So, yeah, a worrying report came out uh, this year. You you may have seen the, bio, the, the biodiversity report of 2009. Um, which said very worryingly that nearly a million species face extinction if we do not fundamentally change our relationship with the natural world. Um, so a lot of species in each sort of category um, and you know uh, increasingly we're seeing species move towards the sort of vulnerable category and the endangered category um, and those are sort of those are sort of growing categories and the list of extinctions um, we can see is sort of uh, is, has been on the up in the last hundred years or so, uh, very sort of high rates of growth um, of extinctions. So this is a very um, a very worrying thing. So when we talk about animal species, a relevant question in relation to species is do animal species have a right to exist or a right to life? So not not the individual, but the species as a whole. Um, and the first thing we can we can think of here is a number of anthro anthropocentric reasons why we might think of animal species of having a right to exist. Um, so anthropocentric and sorry anthropocentric reasons are reasons, in other words, that relate to us as human beings and our interest in in animals rather than um, any sort of intrinsic rights or capacities that animals have that that sort of make them of, of moral concern. So if we go through these first, we, we see firstly there's we have an aesthetic interest in a variety of different life forms, um, naturalists, bird watchers, etc. Um, and all of this would be sort of destroyed if we if we don't sort of preserve species. Um, people go to animal parks, you know, um, they go to Africa and go to go to uh, wildlife parks and so on. Um, so all of this are a part of humans' um, aesthetic interest in seeing animals in their natural habitat, um, and we sort of want to preserve that, and we want to preserve species existence um, for this kind of selfish reason in this case, so we can enjoy them. Uh, we also have nutritional and health interests in preserving species. Uh, the giant Israeli scorpion, which um, stinger has been used in um, in sort of brain diseases, has been proved very very effective um, in treating certain brain diseases. Um, so, so if we you know some, something that's not uh, that's that's sort of very 
a uh, very sort of unknown species species like this can very easily be um, be crushed or can sort of die out in environment as a result of um, of extinction so and we just never know which species that are being made extinct might have important resources important qualities or health interests um, that that could be that could be used by us to make human life to improve human life um, so again that's another sort of self selfish interest that, that we have in species and thirdly knowledge and science um, animals in in the way they are in their makeup in the way that in what they do um, often educate us about the world we live in and provide knowledge that otherwise we wouldn't have about how, how the world works how they interact with it um, and it's sort of various properties that we can explore so um, so the, the values of knowledge and science also so a different question to the anthropological question is to ask whether animal species have intrinsic value or intrinsic rights according to Ralston a species is a coherent ongoing form of life expressed in organisms encoded in gene flow and shaped by the environment right so as an ongoing form of life um, it may be possible to for us to think of of ourselves as having duties to protect a species um, so it sort of has a persistence through time uh, it's shaped by the environment so maybe there's a kind of intrinsic value to animal species um, as well as to the in existence of individual individual animals that deserve treat that deserve concern because they might suffer or so on uh, maybe we have a right to um, preserve and protect the species as well now one interesting thing here there's uh, some cases where we see a conflict uh, between the rights of the individual and the rights of the species for example in some cases wildlife officials have sought to protect herds by euthanizing individual animals or allowing regulated hunting um, for example the, the deer population in New Jersey um, as you may know has been uh, opened up to regulated hunting in recent years um, and and people are allowed in certain areas at certain times in certain conditions to to hunt deer um, so this is um, the, the sort of justification for this is 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 to control overpopulation um, and the kind of dangers that come from from overpopulation so it it, it sort of it protects the species by um, you know by sort of uh, invading the right of, of the individual or, or uh, not not respecting the right of, of the individual but as a doing so in a way that that is intended to protect the species as a whole some in, environmentalists however will agree with this approach um, it has been referred to as environmental fascism um, by Tom Reagan and other people which kind of you know their point is that it it sort of sets up human beings as as the sort of controllers of of animal populations and deciding who gets to live and who gets to die um, so there are some environmentalists who are very um, very unhappy with that kind of approach of putting human beings uh, in this position of making decisions about who is worthy um, to live and who isn't all right now let's look at some ideas and perspectives that should guide us in thinking about the ethical treatment of animals so more general perspectives that we can look at to <clears throat> excuse me to evaluate um, and to think about the issues that we've been talking about so far so just to recap the anthropocentric perspectives um, that we touched on here so we can think of you know the pleasure people find in animals uh, as pets or companions um, some people have an economic interest in raising animals as a source of food and clothing they are used in experiments to taste the safety of effect and effectiveness of drugs detergents and cosmetics and of course ecotourism uh, as we saw often depends on animals thriving in their natural habitats 
So a concern for the health and welfare in, um, of animals is often important to these practices. Um, and it's often imp it's important to us in these various ways. We interact with animals as pets and companions. Uh, we raise them as food and clothing. Uh, we see them in the natural habitats. They, they sort of test um, the effectiveness of drugs and detergents and so on. Um, so they're, they're part of all of these different practices in which human beings have an interest. <coughs> so if we think about a potential sort of virtue ethics perspective here, um, some people see this perspective as tied to um, the way that, that people interact with animals in kind of in these um, in these sort of interested ways. And it's possible to think that people develop important character traits in relating to animals in their daily lives. Um, you know, people that sort of care for animals on a daily basis will have knowledge um, and sort of an instinctual awareness of how to treat them, of, of, of what's good for them and what's not, which is not the case with people who don't spend their time around animals. Um, so that kind of that kind of training, that kind of knowledge, um, that kind of intimate knowledge gives you an understanding of how to treat animals ethically. And it comes from a kind of tradition of behavior. So, for example, the tradition of the fair chase in hunting excuse me, contains a kind of ethical code for how hunters should behave. And part of that code is about um, is about, you know, treating animals fairly is, is about, you know, giving them a kind of fair chance to get away is about, um, you know, procedures for how you relate to other hunters and make sure that there's a safe that, that you obey safety rules. Um, in hunting. So there's a number of things here that might sort of lead us to see a sort of virtue ethics perspective where people in their sort of everyday engagements and their practices and their knowledge of animals are sort of developing an idea of ethical treatment um, that sort of leads them to an understanding of, 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 of treating animals in fair ways, in ways that, that don't sort of exhaust the population, but um, but sort of um, maintain existing population levels through through the kind of practices that, that they adopt. So that might lead us to see a, a kind of virtue ethics perspective. Yeah. <clears throat> Other general non-anthropocentric non reasons we can think about here. Um, and, and, you know, one popular approach uh, is going to focus on the idea of animals as sentient creatures. Uh, meaning they can feel pleasure and pain. So this might mean we have an obligation to avoid animal suffering as much as possible. And this approach, as we've seen, is identified with utilitarianism. As we've talked about, not all human animals will be sensitive to pain and suffering in the same way and to the same degree. So not just, you know, do all animals suffer as humans, but also, you know, what difference differences are there among different animals in degrees of suffering uh, and we'd have to sort of work out those those questions as, as well in trying to think about um, this question of suffering and the ways in which animals are sentient creatures. Philosopher Martha Nussbaum um, talks about this idea of the dignity of animals. So the idea here Nussbaum argues is that animals should be given the chance to live according to the natural dignity of their species. So the idea here is animals should be given a chance to have a flourishing life, okay? But what does it really mean for different animals to live well and what does it mean for them to have a flourishing life? Um, presumably this might rule out certain forms of factory farming, right? Where animals are hemmed in in very close quarters. Sometimes they have their sort of claws um, cut off and their beaks sort of um, cut off as, as well to prevent them harming each other. But does that does that allow them to have a flourishing life? Um, so some of the things that are done seem to seem to rule that out. The sort of growing of animals to unsustainable sizes. So this idea of dignity and, and a flourishing life um, might provide guidelines for the kind of humane treatment of animals in our sort of in our raising animals for food, in our raising animals um, for our own use. Um, how should we you know, contain them? How much should we allow them to roam freely? Um, but I think if we take this idea of dignity seriously, um, it would certainly 
um, pose an issue to um, farming practices and, and certain sort of traditions of animal experimentation as well. Peter Singer, who is um, probably uh, uh, recognized as, as, as a, um, an important voice on this question and has um, quite an interesting and radical perspective, which is worth, uh, worth taking a look at. And he uses this interesting idea of what he calls speciesism. Um, and speciesism is supposed to be, you know, akin to a kind of racism or sexism. Um, and Singer, he argues that um, it, it occurs in, in cases where we don't give equal consideration to the interests of animals. So not treating the interests of animals the same, of, the same as human interests is a form of speciesism. So it's like we're, we're sort of demarcating um, a certain group as not worthy of inclusion um, in the you know in the group that deserves ethical concern um, and we've seen you know we've seen that in in human societies with racism and sexism and um, Singer is arguing that that we do the same thing when we exclude animals from the same interests that we apply to human beings that uh, is a form of speciesism that is on a par with these um, other mor morally objectionable things that, that we do um, the racism and the sexism and it should be treated similarly. So this is a quote from Singer's book Animal Liberation. Um, he says, the appropriate response to those who claim to have found evidence of genetically based differences in ability between the races or sexes is not to stick to the belief that the genetic explanation must be wrong. Whatever evidence to the contrary must turn up. Instead, we should make it quite clear that the claim to equality does not depend on intelligence, moral capacity, physical strength, or similar matters of fact. Equality is a moral ideal, not a similar assertion of fact. There is no logically compelling reason for assuming that a factual difference in ability between two people justifies any difference in the amount of consideration we give to satisfying their needs and interests. The principle of equality among human beings is not a description of an alleged actual equality among humans. It is a prescription of how we should treat humans. Okay, so um, Singer's replying here to people who say, well, there's no, there's not enough factual evidence of equality between humans and animals to sort of to, to, to require us to treat them with moral concern. Um, and until that factual evidence shows up, um, you know, we just have to wait and see and continue to treat them differently, differently and ignore this sort of idea of, of equality. Right. And Singer saying here that we don't, you know, we don't do that in the case of racism or sexism. We don't we don't sort of investigate factual uh, reasons we, and we don't look at sort of factual claims and look at whether they're true. And if they're true, maybe then. We should exclude, you know, we should sort of make exclusions on the basis of fact of sex or race. Rather, we think of equality as a moral ideal, not a factual ideal. And we say, you know, equality is important because of its because it's simply morally, it's morally important to treat people equally. Um, so we so and he's saying we should take the same approach in the case of um, relations between human beings and other species that, that we should assume an idea of moral equality. It's a prescription. In other words, it's a normative idea. It's a moral idea. It's saying how, how we should behave. It's not an assertion of fact. So Singer argues that because non-human an animals have the capacity to feel pleasure and pain, they're sentient, in other words, they have interests that follow from this sentient capacity, right? So animal interests, he claims, should be given the same status and importance of, as human interests. So because they're sentient, they, they're able to sort of they feel pleasure and pain. And so they're able to sort of carry out, um, carry out their interests based on that capacity. They avoid certain things. They pursue other things. Um, and because of that, they have interests. And so those interests should be sort of seen as the same status and importance as human interests. 
So that leads us on to the you know, to the question of rights and if animals have interests, um, can we sort of look at that as a basis for the question of rights? So a right is a legitimate claim on something or some action. Other people may have an, have an obligation or obligations to behave in certain ways to protect the right. So if I have a right to property, I have a right to property of my house or whatever, um, that obligates other people to certain behavior. They, they have an obligation not to enter my property without my consent, um, not to sort of you know do things on my property or damage it in any way. So a right follows, um, consequent obligations follow from a right. So if animals have rights to certain treatment, it means people, human beings, um, have obligations to treat them in certain ways that will protect that right. So what would justify the idea of animal rights? Well, we could think about a couple of justifications. Uh, one thing, non-human animals may be said to have a right not to suffer needlessly. So again, um, suffering and sentience and pain and suffering would be sort of central to that argument. Others like Peter Singer argue that non-human animals have interests. So this includes the idea that non-human animals have the psychological capacity to desire things, even having conscious wishes and hopes. Um, so these features might ground the idea of, of rights. If we think of, of some animals having this sort of capacity to desire, to wish, to hope, um, then they have, you know, there's more scope for including them within this idea of possessing interests. All right, finally, conclusions and next steps. <clears throat> so in this lecture, and we've looked at some of the key issues in animal ethics, um, and I picked out the main issues in the reading this week, uh, moral vegetarian, vegetarianism, animal experimentation, endangered species. Um, and we looked at some of the main ethical approaches to these issues, including virtue ethics, utilitarianism, and rights. Okay, so what I'd like you to do for the um, for the rest of um, the rest of the time that you have left over these couple of days, um, I'd like you to write a discussion question in answer to my week 13 question. So write your thoughts on the discussion question for this week. Um, should be 100, uh, 100 words or so. So just write whatever you what your response is on that question. Um, also, just write a journal. Just write you just write on a piece of paper um, and I'll collect it next week and just explain lay out the ethical framework that you think is most appropriate for thinking about animal ethics we've talked about utilitarianism um, you know the idea of dignity the idea of, you know virtue ethics whether that applies what ethical framework do you think is most appropriate for thinking about animal ethics um, so make sure you mention as well some of the issues that we've talked about in your journal, um, industrial agriculture, moral vegetarianism, animal experimentation, and say how you would how you would deal with those issues based on your ethical framework. So try and say something about that as well. Um, and I'll count the journal for extra credit um, and I'll collect it next week. So the discussion question and the journal question, um, and that should uh, keep keep you occupied. Um, for a while. Um, have fun and I will see you very soon.